and welcome to a very special panel with Charlize Theron, a retrospective on her action hero career as a total badass. Charlize is known for her incredible range as a performer, and over the past two decades, she's really cemented herself as one of our best and most impressive modern action stars. With her latest movie, The Old Guard, out on Netflix, we're going to look back at some of her most iconic roles and hear her break down her journey and evolution in her own worlds. So thank you, Charlize, <laughs> with that introduction uh, for being here and taking the time. Thank you. Of course. Um, you know, uh, again, I, I kind of put that all in context, but I'm curious at what point in your career uh, did you know that you wanted to transition into focusing on more action focused roles? You know, I don't remember a specific moment. I don't think it was like, you know, like, like I woke up one day and I said, you know what? I'd like to do action movies. I think that I have just always wanted to explore it. They're just, I never had the opportunity to, I mean, just, just for you to understand, like I was raised with a mother who loved Chuck Norris movies and Charles Bronson movies. So, and my dad loved the Mad Max films. I was raised on action films. Like that's the majority of the movies that we watched were those kind of movies. And then, you know, through, you know, my, it was peppered with a little bit of like, you know, Sophie's choice and Kramer versus Kramer at like super inappropriate ages, like eight, nine, and 10. But I think it summed up how, where my career went. I have always had an affinity for all of the genres. You know, unfortunately, 30 years ago, there just wasn't a lot of opportunity for women to do movies like this. And the first time that that opportunity kind of showed itself was after I won my Academy Award in 2004. And it was really hard making that film in flux. It was really hard in the sense that there were so many preconceived ideas and there were all these boxes that everybody wanted to kind of like squeeze you into. It was a character that I think today would be celebrated, you know, cinematically way more than it was in 2004. It was just hard. And I remember the film that really, you know, didn't play as, as well as everybody thought. And there was just this moment in my career where, I realized very clearly that because that movie didn't really perform, that I wasn't necessarily, maybe I wasn't going to be given another opportunity. And it was really harsh. It was like, no, women can't make these movies successful. It was harsh. And it wasn't until Mad Max Fury Road came my way that I, you know, that, that experience and what happened with that film really changed my, the trajectory for me. And it, made me realize, no, wait a second, like there's, there's a lot of possibilities here. You just have to find the right people who are willing to take the risk and wanted to go want to explore these stories with, with women. And I made an active choice to look out for those filmmakers, to look out for that kind of material, to try and develop it myself as produ as a producer. And that's kind of where I find myself today. I really like playing in, in all the different genres. I don't think of myself as you know, having a particular affinity for just one. And, and the, the good news now is, you know, we've kind of changed the genre for women. I think it's very, there's great evidence where we now know it's, you know, we can't hide behind ignorance anymore. Audiences love these films. They love how we're now telling these narratives with women at the core um, it's made for, I think the stunt world, it's given it just, you know, there's just a facelift. It's just, it feels fresh to kind of explore the world of action with women, with women fighting and all of that stuff really excites me. Yeah. You, you touched on so many things there that I want to dig in deeper with you because I think it is interesting. You know, I was, one of my questions I wanted to ask you, but you kind of answered there is what you would consider your first almost action role because I default to Aeon Flux, but then I'm curious if, you know, the Italian job too was kind of your first introduction in that space to a lot of people. But like you said, you know, with Aeon Flux, um, there was this perception that I feel like we're discussing and hopefully continuing to overcome that if one movie that tries something different fails, like a female action hero movie fail, well, we can never touch it again. But you did continue to go on and it sounds like you were actively pursuing finding those roles like with Hancock and Prometheus uh, and even Snow White and the Huntsman up through Mad Max Fury Road, that that was something that you continued, you know, looking out for yourself, if I'm not putting words into yourself, looking out for yourself, but making sure that that door continued to be open. Yes, very much so. I mean, I think you're right. 
we can't just look at action as just physical. For sure, the Italian job was a great experience in the sense that I realized there was still so much misconception around women in the genre, even though that film is, the action is really based on, on cars. We had to physically do a lot of that stuff. I mean, the, the only good thing that came out of that experience was that there was a real pressure to pull off those stunts with the actors. And that was the first time I experienced anything like that. But there was, um, there was a very unfair process that went with that. You know, I was the only woman with a bunch of guys. And I remember vividly getting the schedule in our pre-production and they had scheduled me for six weeks more car training than any of the guys. And I just, it was just so insulting, but it was also the thing that put a real fire under my ass. And I was like, all right, you guys want to play this game? Let's go. And, you know, I made it a point to outdrive all of those guys. I vividly remember Mark Wahlberg halfway through one of our training sessions, pulling over and throwing up because he was so nauseous from doing 360s. Yeah. Um, but I was very proud of the stunt work that we did in that. I mean, I did a stunt in that movie where I do a three, a reverse 360 or maybe 180 in a warehouse with props everywhere and people. And I did that stunt completely on my own. And it was like, a, it was a huge moment of like feeling like, yeah, we can do all of this stuff. And women are so unfairly thought of or treated when it comes to, comes to the genre. I, it's, it's interesting you talk about that because that is one thing, you know, when I went back and I was watching these films in preparation for this, not only, um, kind of the trends in the action genre and how movies were shot, where you look at Aeon Flux and it was at a time when a lot of action scenes were like these quick cuts together to, to ramp up performance. But then you get to what we have today with, you know, Atomic Blonde and the Old Guard and you have these like just impressive, single take shots all in frame showing the the um artistry of of stunt choreography and really putting it on the performer to come and say okay it's as much as you can kind of put into it how is that it sounds like the you know obviously you've put in the work <laughs> we've seen it it's amazing for these these movies but how has that kind of evolution changed how you approach um the the stunt work that you want to um participate in in these films yeah, such a great observation. I really didn't know anything about that either until I worked on Atomic Blonde. And it was really all of the stunt coordinators on that film who set just from the from the get go, the, the tone was set. We want to do long action takes. We want to do continuous. Um, I mean, it was the first time I think we I, I listen, I don't know, like historically, but I know that there was a real attempt to do a first, which was a spliced together take, which really played as one, but it meant that logistically we had to shoot seven to 10 minutes of action continuously. And I know that sounds like nothing, but as a performer, that means that you have to get everything right in seven to 10 minutes. And that is an incredibly difficult thing to do, especially for actors. And for myself, I'm not, I'm not a martial arts fighter. I've never trained in martial arts. But the, but it's plausible. And that's, that's what's so incredible. And I was really proud of the action that we accomplished in Atomic Blonde. It felt to me like we were pushing the envelope and we were saying that this concept that, that somehow women in the industry have been arguing to fight like men is just so ridiculous. And that when we celebrate women fighting like women and that we're smart about what body parts we would be using that we know we can't really punch because we'll, we will break every bone in our hand, but that we can fight just as hard with our elbows, with our heads, with our knees. That, that was when it became really exciting to me. And, you know, I think that what's great is that there is no one way, but that we are definitely pushing it. You know, you can look at a film like Fury Road um, and there's, there's definitely more edit in that film. George Miller's style in shooting his action is fast paced, but it's done in a way that doesn't feel like a cheat. You know, I think editorially we've always cheated action. And when you don't cheat it, people really know they can feel it. And that authenticity has really, I think, been celebrated in the last decade. It's also made it really hard for crappy action movies to survive because the bar has been set so high. Yeah. Yeah. You look at, at especially something like Mad Max and you're just like, 
you know, I've, I've read the stories, I've watched the behind the scenes, but I can't even, you know, I can't even wrap my head around what went into actually making that movie because it feels so visceral just sitting down and watching it from the comfort of my couch. <laughs> yeah, listen, I, I, I don't think I will ever recover from the making of that film. It was, it was a tremendous feat, what we pulled off all of us. It was hard. It was difficult. It was difficult in a different way than what I was just talking about with Atomic Blonde and those continuous scenes and, and long play action in the sense that the physicality was very real. It was very, very rare that George wanted the stunt team to rely on too much wire work. And so a lot of like physical lifting in that movie was real. Um, like holding your body up on a car or pulling yourself out of a car and getting over to another vehicle or action that was happening on driving vehicles consistently. It was incredibly tedious. And, um, but that was the challenge in that. And, and, you know, I think when a filmmaker can listen to, you know, just the narrative, the story of Mad Max is supposed to make you feel incredibly exhausted. You're supposed to be on a three day car chase and that is just exhausting. And it became, it was an exhausting shoot. I mean, he physically got us all to a place where none of that was, was being manufactured. It came from yeah. such a real place. Well, I love, you know, it's really interesting that you refer to that as, as feeling like a big turning point for you, which I can completely you know, understand. And, and I read a quote that you said when you were talking about the roles that you find yourself gravitating to is, you know, especially in the action genre is they, you said they aren't victims, but they also aren't superheroes. And you look at a character like Furiosa and yes, Mad Max is by its title, a Mad Max movie, but Furiosa is really the main character, the central driving uh, hero of that story. So when you look back at characters like Furiosa and, and Lorraine and Andy, like what are you, what draws you to these roles in addition to the action opportunities that you get in these films? I think in general, I'm intrigued by, I guess, the messiness of being a human, especially a woman. And I think that for me, when we talk about representation, not just racial representation and cultural representation, but female representation, I remember vividly just feeling such a lack of watching conflicted women on cinema. I felt like there was always a part of me as an actor that felt so unbelievably jealous of people like Jack Nicholson and Robert De Niro, who got to play all of these really f***ed up people. And women very rarely got to explore that. It was like there was this inerrant fear of putting a woman in circumstances where she might not shine. Um, and it was, I do believe, you know, society has us still somewhat in this Madonna horror complex box. Like we can either be really good hookers or we can be really good mothers, but anything in between people are sometimes not brave enough to want to go and explore. And it's so sad to me because the richness of those stories are not actually not only great entertaining, um, stories to tell great movies to, to make, but it's a disservice to women in general. We are more complicated than those two things. And we can be many things. And that our strengths can come from our faults and from our mistakes and from our petty and our, and our vulnerabilities and, and our madness. Like those are, those are the things that make us interesting. And so I've never ever, I have a knee jerk reaction when anybody ever pitches me a story or has this like, you know, first line, like, she is a warrior and she is a hero. Um, it, sim it oversimplifies, I think, the complexities and the beauty of what it means to be a woman. And I've never, ever strived to inherently underline those qualities in any of the characters that I've played. I think all of my characters have had this sense of they're all survivors. They're all just trying to survive. And that I can relate to. As a woman, I can relate to that. I am not a hero. I don't relate to heroes. I think people who inspire me are people who don't think of themselves as, as heroes. They're, they put their head down, they do the work. And I, 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 I can, I don't know. I, I have an affinity for that. I like that. And that is a quality that I really respond to. And so I don't want my women 
the characters that I play. I don't want any of them to feel like women that we can't sit in a cinema and say, yeah, I see a little bit of myself in there. I know, uh, you know, I, I read the the great New York Times piece um, that was put together looking back at the the five year anniversary of uh, Mad Max Fury Road. And, and a lot of what was discussed in there was how, um, you know, when you guys were there on the ground, you were you were trusting in George for his overall vision, but you didn't have kind of that full perspective of what the finished product would be. I'm curious now, five years later, and you look back at who Furiosa is now for so many people and, and what that movie is, what is your perspective on what you guys ultimately created in, in that character? I'm incredibly proud of what we pulled off. I really am. I'm, I'm really proud of that character. Furiosa is definitely one of, I think, the most important characters I've ever played. And I saw the potential. I knew how special it was right from the beginning. And I chased it really hard because of that. I saw, I saw something that I had never seen before as an opportunity for myself as an actor. And I think it was to show a female character in a way that felt, I don't know, just it, the closest thing that I can kind of, the analogy, the, the closest moment in my own life that I can look back too, was when the first time I saw Sigourney Weaver play Ripley, it just changed everything for me. It, 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 it was like the world opened up and the possibilities were just endless. The, the amount of intelligence that she brought to that role, she was completely in demand of it. It was, she owned that world, but it wasn't forced and it wasn't written and it wasn't acted. It was just lived. And, and it was, she was, she she was just living in that world in such an authentic way. And Furiosa was the first time that I really felt like I couldn't even look at her as a character. She felt so real to me. And maybe it was because the shoot was so hard. The fact that we were there for so long, that we really did live in that environment for so long, that made me feel that way about her. I don't know if that, you know, if that character can, in a small part, do what Ripley did for me as as, a, as an actress, as a woman, that's something that I'm incredibly proud of. That's That doesn't happen in everybody's career. And I feel really lucky that I was given that opportunity, that I was prepared for that opportunity, and that I was willing to, you know, to lay it all, to lay it all out there, to really, to give it my all. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And then, you know, you've been producing your own movies since Monster, but uh, I, I, you know, looking back and kind of reading up on the trajectory of things, you came up off Mad Max Fury Road and you had had uh, Atomic Blonde option for a while to, to produce. And I, you know, I look at that story and that, that is a title that feels like it was really important to you. Not only did you option it, but you pursued David Leach as, as director, you know, after seeing his work on John Wick and, and you helped push the action scenes in that uh, movie to be as impressive uh, as they ended up being through, you know, reading interviews with, with the various choreographers and, and everyone who worked on it. So why was that movie so important for you? And what does it mean to you now at as, you know, that point in your career? It was the first time that I developed something from such a small, tiny little kernel. I mean, we, we, there was an unpublished graphic novel. We were sent eight pages. It wasn't even finished. And we said, I said yes to those eight pages. I think, I think the reason why I pushed as hard as I did on that film was because, you know, and this is just a sad truth. There's still a part of me as a female actor that always feels like this might be the last opportunity. Um, and that's a whole, it's, it's, it's terrible that that's kind of in my psyche. It's also the thing that drives me and puts a real fire under my ass to get it right. And it, I was relentless on that film. And because we were, I felt like there, I carried a responsibility since I was developing it that I couldn't kind of look back and say, well, you know, it was a script that was, I was in charge of everything. And I, I didn't want to get it wrong. I wanted to get it right because because there's a part of me that still, you know, I still sometimes feel like that, that if you get it wrong that one time, it's kind of like what we were talking about with the unflux, that you just will not be given that opportunity again. 
and listen, this, this, my kind of entry in, into action has come much later in my life. You know, I, I made Atomic Blonde when I was 40 years old. Um, there's a sense of like feeling like, okay, time is running out. You got to get it right. If you really want to, this means this much to you and you, and you want to kind of stay in this game. You got to get it right. And so there was a lot of pressure. I put a lot of pressure on everybody on that movie. I hired David Leach for that reason that he could handle it. You know, I, I said to him, you're, I'm never going to stop and I'm going to expect you to never stop. And like mediocre, medi any kind of mediocrity is going to be the enemy on this film. And when I look back at the behind the scenes, I mean, the, both of us, the, the, that whole team, Sam Hargraves, who now has his own career as a director, shot a lot of those action pieces we we left it all on on the dance floor we really did and again you really are as good as the people that you get to work with and i i was very lucky that i got to work with really good people on that film great people on that film when you talk about some of these sequences in, in movies like making you tired as the viewer watching that stare like i am tired with you as lorraine just keeps getting knocked down and keeps getting back up and keeps fighting <laughs> It's incredible. I, you know, I know, um, obviously, David had worked on John Wick before, but, you know, now as you as you have this sense of ownership, which is so exciting to see and like, you know, you you creating the projects, right, and championing the projects that you want to make, that you want to star in. Do you have that sense of like you look at other movies that are happening in the space or, or creators who are working out there and you're like, I want to do that. I can do that. I want to pursue that. Do you feel like you, you, are, you are able or... or do you have, I guess I'm curious, do you, is that even kind of how you approach looking at which projects to take next? Very much so, yeah. And I feel really lucky that there are other women doing this at the same time. You know, people who I consider friends, people like Patty, Jen Patty Jenkins, who, you know, she's really kind of raised that bar as to what, you know, that type of movie looks like and feels like. I'm constantly inspired by what other women are doing out there. And I'm also inspired by how we're all backing each other up, how we so want each other to succeed for the sake of everybody. You know, we, we realize here in the, this position where you get to have the opportunity, there's, there is, there's a, a responsibility to hand that baton over, to open the door, to keep it open, that it's not just about you. And in that sense, it's been really amazing to kind of see, listen, it's still disproportionate to, you know, our male counterparts out there. We, we have to, we have to kind of keep putting the pressure on our industry to, to change that. But I'm constantly inspired. I want, I want my, my, I have two young girls. I want my two young girls to grow up and not even think that this is weird or that this is unusual or that this is strange. I want this to be normalized. Yeah, I, I fully agree. And I love that, like, even since Atomic Blonde, you came out, there's a reveal in uh, The Fate of the Furious. Cypher is the real big bad the whole time. You're our, you're a villain in that. And then we get caught up to the old guard as well. And, and watching the old guard and seeing that scene where you and Kiki Lane are just duking it out in the, the airplane that's flying by. And I was just watching it. And I was like, gosh, this action is so cool and it's it's weird that like i've almost come to expect it now especially from like the, the action roles you choose or i'm like yeah of course charlie's would like be having this incredible <laughs> long take and then putting all this into it you know i'm i'm curious like what was it about this part in andy uh in the comic that really really spoke to you uh and and i you know, from reading kind of the, the production material and, and seeing interviews behind the scenes that this, even from everything you did before, required an additional layer of training because Andy as a character had such a wealth of, uh, you know, different um, fighting style expertise by virtue of being you know, millennia old. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, the first thing that kind of grabbed me was the just seeing a lot of potential in raising the physical bar, that action bar. I felt like this world really lent itself, these characters, the circumstances, and the set pieces really lent themselves to uh, really challenging act action. action. And I, I, I think that was one of the first things that I noticed. But I'm, I don't think I would ever want to just make a film based on how great I could create action scenes. There was very much an emotional story here that resonated 
even though this is a sci-fi story that feels incredibly grounded in reality. And I think the the struggle with humanity in this is is very ever present present, even just looking at where we are and we find ourselves today in this kind of social and cultural place that we're in. This story lives and breathes very much in that, which is unusual, I think, sometimes in sci-fi. But I think I my taste is just always going to, you know, movies like Prometheus. Like if there's not an emotional connection that I can kind of like hang my coat on, I don't, it's very hard for me to invest. And I think when you find a piece of material that lends itself to both, you realize how special that is. And when I read this graphic novel, I saw great potential for us to celebrate both of those boxes and, 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 and push the envelope. Yeah. I, I, you know, I had this, when I read the graphic novel for the first time, I was just so impressed by kind of the scope and, and humanity of these characters. And, and it's so interesting how you guys imbued that and brought that to life, uh, on, on the, on Netflix and in the show. Um, I, I'm curious, like how, how have some of your experiences almost layered on each other, fed into each other, because I hear you talk about going from Mad Max to Atomic Blonde. And I can imagine like the, the skill set from going from Atomic Blonde to the old guard is the same. Like, what do you bring with you and what are you looking to challenge yourself with in these roles? I think you touched upon it earlier. You know, there's a difference in style of fighting. So that's always nice, right? So you're hitting the gym and realizing you're going to learn some new skills. (laughs) <laughs> there was a sense of uh, there was a sense of fighting in most of the movies that I've done. That even though there's a skill level and there's a style of fighting, um, I still played women where I mean they were allowed to get scrappy, you know. And so when you can get scrappy, you can hide a lot of a lot of things. In, in this case, I couldn't because this character is so skilled and her, the wealth of information just in martial arts is, is, is thousands and thousands of years old. Anybody who knows anything about martial arts knows that the discipline that goes behind, you know, learning any kind of martial arts is, is, is so gnarly. I have read books of martial arts fighter, martial art artists who, you know, give everything up and go live in a hut in Thailand for 40 years. And uh, that's to learn one style of fighting. So we knew that that was definitely an obstacle. (laughs) The narrative of trying to get that story across had to be very specific. We had four months and we had to really hone in on the things that I could really excel at. And so that that first, those first couple of weeks when you walk into the gym, you're really trying to assess. You're trying to see what you can excel in, what you shouldn't even be wasting any time on. And that's when you know you have a good team. And Danny Hernandez, our fight coordinator on this, was really, really good at watching me and and realizing that we never wanted to force a circle into a square. We had what we had, and we had to figure out what could shine out of that. And so a lot of it was, for me, focusing you know, for me in the beginning, I think when I started my action career, it was just so important to sell the authenticity of like, yes, I can fight and I can, I can't take this guy down and I can survive this. Like there was such a, a level of like wanting to prove that to audiences who for years said like, no, a woman could never fight a guy that size. In this case, it wasn't so much like, yeah, I can take the guy down. It was like, I can take the guy down with real technique. And so that I had never really, I never had to work on before. I I wanted to end kind of with a forward looking question. I read this quote um, from your partner at your production company, Denver and Delilah, AJ Dix, uh, who told uh, the New York Times that quote, to his, to their mind, nothing scares you. And I'm curious for you at this point, do you feel that? Do you feel that that's true? Do you feel like there are things that you look at and you're like, nah, that's, that's too intimidating or too much? Or does that just kind of drive you to rise to the challenge on, on what that thing would be? I think that the essence that I put forth, that there might be no fear, is completely motivated by fear. <laughs> I, think I, I think I just cover it up. But the truth of it is that everything actually scares me. I don't know really how to create 
not from a place of fear. Um, not that I'm saying that you can't. I just, I just have never. I don't know if I ever could. I think the idea of going into a project and not being scared would actually freak me out. <laughs> it would feel really wrong. I think that my creativity really thrives around my fear. I think I'm just very good at covering it up. And I think there's a part of how I was raised that made, um, not that it necessarily is the right thing, but I was raised very much in the sense of like, you know, you just, you get up, you do it and you don't really like wallow in anything. You don't really show any of that stuff, but it doesn't mean that I don't feel it. I feel it on an every day, every second basis. But it, I think it is the thing that makes me not stop. And it's the thing that keeps me up every night when we're shooting a film. Uh, I play the movie over and over and over and over and over in my head because I realize that you have 30, 60, 100 days to shoot it. And then after that, that's it. Like the, It's in the can and if you don't have it, you don't have it. And so I think I have an obsessive nature, but I definitely, it's very sweet that AJ says that about me and he knows me really well. I think I said forth that energy, but really, truly it is fully fed by panic. Listen, if you continue delivering the finished products that we get from panic and fear, I think uh, we're all just lucky to have you there um, putting that oh. putting that energy into these projects and, and um, yeah, continuing to raise the caliber of what uh, action and so many of the other genres you work in as well um, can be. So thank you for that. Thank you for taking the time to talk today. It's just been such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you for taking the time to want to talk about these things. I really of appreciate course. that. Thank you. It's it's important. It's important that we talk about it and we reflect on how far we've come um, and hopefully inspire more people to keep wanting to uh, push the bar as we go forward. Um, so Shirley, exactly. The Old Guard is, of course, on Netflix right now. People can check that out. But thank you so much for taking the time. And I look forward to the next chat with you. Thank you so much.